Last year, obviously, we did not have New England Revival Conference because of COVID. It's good to be back. But uh, next year, Brother uh, Gordon Poe and Brother Victor Jackson have, been, have agreed to come and minister. Uh, Brother Shelton was on the schedule for tomorrow night, but he's sick. So uh, Brother Denzel Holman has agreed to come minister. Brother Holman's written about 10 books. He's on prayer. He just relocated to New England. And this, is our, this is his first chance to minister in New England. So that'll be tomorrow night. Next year, we, will, we hope to have children's ministry again, but we're kind of in a hybrid from COVID. We still haven't kicked that off yet. So um, keep that in mind. Good to have Brother Sternman with us, Superintendent of Mass Rhode Island. As most of you know, this, this meeting's a little different in that we're kind of a, uh, a tri-state. Just, just churches in this area said, we need to break through in this area. We're not trying to have a huge conference. We're not competing with anything. We just, uh, when you stop and think about it, when, when America was turned upside down with the awakenings, much of that happened in this tri-state area. Throw in New York and a few places down south where the camp meetings happened, and, and the major movements in America happened in, in this neck of the woods. And we want to see that again. We want to encourage one another. And that's why we come together to do this. And uh, we're privileged this year to have Brother Spite with us tonight. He's going to minister. Brother Spite came to uh, New York, Rochester, New York, 45 years ago, and they took a a church, basically a building, not much, many people, just a, a, a building. And, and over the years, God has raised up a great church. And um, Brother Spite has served in many different capacities, including the superintendent of New York State. He is now an honorary presbyter. He served as a presbyter there and North American missions director. I don't know what all he did there, but uh, one of the reasons I, uh, we felt to invite him was he knows New England. Uh, New York, New England, some people include New York right along with us. Uh, he knows what it's like to dig out a church. And so he can speak to us as one who's been here for 45 years and who's seen God do great things. So would you welcome Brother Spite as he comes to minister tonight in Rochester, New York. Thank you, Brother Hanson. What an amazing, powerful move of God's Spirit is in this room tonight. And uh, I think it would be a wonderful thing for us to just entertain the presence of the Lord just a little more here. What a wonderful privilege it is to be not only uh, together, but to be in the presence of the Lord. Let's, let's love God again. Can we do that right now? Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, God. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Well, this is amazing. Really, I truly am amazed. When I walked through the door, I was not expecting the move of God's presence that I experienced, and I'm so thrilled to be uh, here, to be able to feel the presence of the Lord. Brother Sternman, it's good to see you. God bless you. Always appreciated all that you contributed to the general board in your comments and your spirit. Well, thank you so much, Brother Hanson. What a magnificent uh, expression of Christianity is Brother Hanson and Sister Hanson. God bless them. Love these folks. Wonderful people. Amen. Praise the Lord. While you're still standing, uh, I'll read a, a scripture and then uh, let you be seated out of Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but a righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. 
I want to talk a little bit about the things that make for peace. Let's pray together. Father, in your name, I pray, God, your anointing will be upon our communication. You'll bless the feeble efforts of this poor servant right now. Give me that ability. Give me that whatever it is that makes the difference between speaking and preaching here tonight in the wonderful name of the Lord. And everyone said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The things which make for peace... That's what we're supposed to be after, going after the things that make for peace. And uh, it's a wonderful privilege to be with ministers tonight who lead the way in this requirement of Christianity that uh, are continually seeking for those things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another. I like the idea of having the kind of meeting you're having here tonight. I, I think it's a wonderful thing to do this. Uh, the Lord knows that we need this kind of gathering, particularly in the days that we're living in now. We need to be getting together because we need this encouragement from one another. There's a powerful uh, force that we experience when we come together. Even if we didn't do anything except just have a cup of coffee together, we would leave strengthened and edified by the very fact that we were together. But there's an edification in this room that is amazing to me. And I, I thank God for your allowing me to have the very high honor and privilege of being a part of this tonight. I remember one time I met with a couple of brethren for breakfast. I was on my way there. It was about 70 miles away from my house. And I thought to myself as I was going there early in the morning, why in the world did I ever ask these guys to meet me for breakfast? I was so tired. I was discouraged. I, I was in that position that I was... In one time when I, when I fell across the bed at my house and, uh, and I said, God, is, it is enough. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I said, it's enough. Just take my life. I just can't go on. And then all of a sudden, my wife comes in. She said, what's wrong with you? And I, I just realized when she said that, I had not yet had a cup of coffee that, sm that morning. I said, honey, could you fix me a cup of coffee? I, and, and she did. And I'll tell you, as soon as I had the first sip, God was back on his throne. And, uh, and everything was good. Well, that's, I was in that same state of uh, semi-depression when I was on my way down there. And I really was truly physically exhausted. And I thought, when I get home, I'm going to go to bed. But after I sat down with those guys, we started talking about the things of the Lord and I was on my way back. I, I started thinking, well, well when, as soon as I get back, I need to take care of this and take care of that. I need to have a meeting with these guys and, and so on. I had all kinds of ambition. And I thought, what in the world happened? And I realized when you get with the people of God, you get with people that are of faith and people that, that talk about the good things of the Lord. There's an energizing that takes place when we do that. The things that make for peace is... We're doing that here tonight. We're together, and I feel a great, wonderful camaraderie and brotherhood here. And I think that God's got a tremendous revival for this area. I feel that. And I felt it when I walked in. I thought, wow, I did not expect that here in this area. I don't know what I, why I had a, a kind of a preconceived notion that somehow it was, it was kind of like dark and a struggle here, but I got a feeling the devil's in trouble in this area, and primarily because of the oneness that I feel in this room here tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I, I, I'll tell you what, if I, uh, I, I really don't think that there's a whole lot of power that he's got against the decision of the church that they're going to rise to do the work of God. I think we give way too much credit for him, and he wants us, to, of course, to feel that way about it because that's a denial of the power of God. He's on the leash of God. He can't do anything unless God allows him to do it. And so I think we ought to just say, hey, you know, whatever's going on in this world, somebody's in control of what's going on in this world today. It's definitely not the devil, and it's certainly not the minds that think they're conspiring to arrange and engineer human uh, conduct. The power of God is working in the world today, and God's setting things up for the church. We're getting ready to have an unprecedented revival that's never been in human history before. I say that because this iniquity has never been greater, and iniquity that is abounding is causing the love of many to wax cold, but it's, it's causing a hunger to develop in people that have been looking for God all along and not been able to find Him because of the uh, huge distraction that organized religion has offered to humanity, but that, that's going by the wayside now. 
And people are realizing that that can't fill the void that's in their heart. People are realizing right now, too, that they can't be a part of this world and feel like they're respectable or look at themselves in the mirror as a supposing that they've got some kind of dignity. You can't have that and be associated with this world as it is today. I think that people right now are being prepared for the bright shining of the light and the declaration of God that in this last day that he's going to cause something to happen relative to those that are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in this last time because where iniquity abounds grace does much more abound and we are what we are by the grace of God and you've never been what you're about to be because the grace of God is about to pour out unprecedented relationship with God in that identity, that name that is above every name. Praise God. Praise. Somebody clap your hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. The kingdom. Jesus came to bring it turned over the responsibility, delegated it to his disciples. And I think we're about to see that stone hewed out of the mountain. It's going to come down, tearing down the kingdoms of this world. There's an amazing scripture in the Bible that always amazes me when I look at it. It's found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 through 13. Jesus came to Capernaum. And while he was there, there came to him a centurion, beseeching him, saying, Lord, thy, my servant is at home. He's sick of the palsy. Jesus said, well, I'll come and heal him. And, and the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come into my house, to come under my roof. But just speak the word. If you speak the word, I'm a centurion. I understand chain of command. I understand what delegation is about. If you'll speak the word, then I, I know that my servant, he said, I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers that are under me. I say to this man, go, and he goes, and I say to this man, stay, and he stays, and whatnot. He said, I know that if you just give me the word, that I can take care of this. If you give me the word, I think that's what's being implied here. He knew that if, he, if Jesus gave him the word and his servant being one with him by way of submission in that chain of command, that flow right down to his servant. And that servant would be healed. Jesus was astonished at this. The Bible said that he marveled at this. We're talking about the one who holds the power of the world in his hand, who speaks to the wind and waves and causes them to subside. We're talking about the one who has incredible ability to read the human heart. And he is marveling. He's amazed. He's astonished at this. There's two places in the Bible where Jesus marveled. And they were both relative to the same dynamic of delegation. The other place was in his own hometown where they did not receive him. And he could do no mighty work there for their unbelief. They knew him. They knew what his history was. They had seen him. He was one of them. How could he have this kind of power? And he could do no mighty work there for their unbelief. He marveled at that. He marveled at their lack of understanding of delegation. And he also marveled at the centurion's understanding of delegation and said, I've not found this kind of faith. No, not in Israel. What kind of faith are we talking about? He ties it to the end time revival that we're talking about. When he says, I say to you that many are going to come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom but the children of the kingdom are going to be cast out. There's going to be gnashing of teeth. There's going to be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. We're talking about the end time. We're talking about many coming in to the kingdom of God. I believe a number that no man can number is what he was seeing and what he was determining. That it was going to be as a result of this faith, this kind of faith that this centurion had. That said, I, I, 
I, I know that you are under authority, and because you're under authority, you have authority, and because you have authority, I'm putting myself under you, saying I'm not worthy to, for you to come into my house. This is where I am. You're the boss. You're the master, and I know if you speak the word, I can take that word, and my servant will be healed. Faith. Faith in the delegate. Faith. Faith in the representative of the boss. That the authority of the master resides in the servant when the servant is appointed to manage the talents and occupy till he returns. Faith that says that if you don't want this servant to rule over you, ultimately the master will say, those servants that did not want me to rule over them, bring them here, and I'll deal with them. Faith in the delegate. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. There's going to be a mighty move of God's Spirit through chain of command. I want to talk to you about unity tonight. Because unity has to be based on chain of command. No greater faith than to say this man, no matter what his credentials, no matter what he looks like, no matter how tall, no matter how short, no matter how able, no matter how articulate, it doesn't matter what his abilities are. If he's been appointed... If there's a delegation here in the picture, he's got the authority. That's what's going to cause a church to rise in revival. That's what causes Ethiopians to be healed by the power of that unity that is only possible through submission to a prevailing viewpoint by way of that prevailing viewpoint prevailing because it's assigned responsibility of authority. So, I, 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 I want unity. I, I think it was Brother Teclamarian that said, if I remember right, when he was asked about uh, praying, do you, how, are you, how do you pray for revival? He said, we don't pray for revival. We pray for unity. And if we have unity, we're going to have revival. I'll say that about this district here. You're gonna, you already have revival, and I believe it's because you are united. And I think unity comes primarily by, not by our agreement. We're never going to agree. We're too different. We're too unique. We're not supposed to agree. What we are supposed to do is have humility and understanding about God's appointment to where we're willing to submit ourselves to the prevailing viewpoint of the person who's in charge that has to bear the responsibility. If we were going to take a trip. Uh, from here to Rochester, and some say, let's go by the river, and others said, well, let's go, and we're in, let's say we're in hostile Indian territory, way back in the days of the uprising of the American natives, and we, and, and so there's all kinds of dis disagreement about how we're going to, what's the best way to get there. Let's take the scenic route. No, let's take the easiest route. No, let's, let's take the more sure and safest route. Well, we, 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 we'd better find some way to agree, even if we can't agree on the way we should go. Let's agree that there's going to be somebody that's going to have the prevailing viewpoint so we can go together. It doesn't matter to me how we get to revival, whether it's the slow way, the fast way, the scenic way, the safe way, or the dangerous way. Let's get to revival. Somebody take a prevailing viewpoint position and say the authority is mine the decision is mine let's go Praise hallelujah God. I remember my family one time my father was dying and what a wonderful man he was I have not feared death since that day that I was there when he died as he said son I'm I'm about to get my promotion and he said, I'm happy for three things. And he said, one, that I'm going out with relatively little pain. In fact, no painkillers at all with colon cancer that he was dying of. And he said, I'm also glad that uh, I got all my children around me. And he said, and said, finally, I'm glad most of all that I finally get to ask the Lord about all those questions I had to put on the shelf. You know, that's a wonderful way to live, to just say, you know what, God knows, and we're not supposed to know. If we knew, why would we need faith? We have to have faith to walk with God. We have to embrace the mystery. We have to be rejoicing 
in the understanding that we don't have understanding, but that God does and all is well. And that's how I feel tonight about the whole world. I feel everything's good. And, uh, but anyhow, the family's there, and we were talking as we were sitting around the living room with Dad, and we were all talking about, bragging about, in fact, how we'd die for one another. Then my father passed away, and then everybody was at one another's throat. All kinds of disagreement about this and that was surfacing. And my youngest sister said, Steve, what is going on? We were just talking about how much we love one another, how we'll die for one another. And she said, and now everybody's at one another's throat. What's going on here? I said, well, our unity was not by our connection to one another. We were just spokes in the wheel of this family, and dad was the hub. And our connection to one another was our connection to him. Now we've got to build relationships with one another from the ground up. Well, let me tell you this. Our unity is by the power of our connection to the hub. If we're all submitted to the wheel in the middle of the wheel, if we are all united in our devotion to the hub, this thing is going to move. It's going to move in a grand way. It's going to move in a revival way. It's going to move in a miraculous way. This thing's going forward. And I'm glad I'm part of it. Jesus really illustrated this principle when he sent them out two by two. And I wondered about that before, but I don't anymore. I know now what it is. It's because there's something, there's a dual nature in God of a yes and amen, of a will and a performance of the will. That God himself puts his word above his name and God himself is subject to his own word. And he makes everything after the counsel of his own will, that dual nature, that yes, and amen of performance that Jesus came in, the power of yes and amen. And uh, he sent them out two by two, so somebody would have to submit to somebody. Because any time a group of people get together, somebody has got to take charge. So he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. There is the yes and amen right there. There is the body and the head. There is, and they both have the identity of Christ. The body and the head. The director and the performer. The yes and the amen. Powerful. If we understand it, that you're not denying who you are when you submit to legitimate authority, that you're not losing anything relative to your value, that all of the kingdom of God is equal. There's no mountains, there's no valleys, there's no variableness in God. We're all together, one in Him, regardless of what part of the body that you're a part of. We're one together, and all is well tonight. The driving for preeminence is a drive of self-destruction. We don't want to have that. We want to say, I want equality. I want to have that same identity that my brother's got is part of the body of Jesus Christ. Not one can say to another, I have no need of you. The head, we know who the head is. Cannot say to the feet, whoever would be the least, I have no need of you. In fact, he says it this way, when you've done it to the least, you did it to me. Because all the way down, no matter what it is, not even that's the wrong way, that wrong terminology. It's all the way across. What, no matter what part of the body you are, you're just as important as anybody else. There's nobody here less than another. There's no mountain. There's no valleys. There's no better, no lesser. There's no important and not important. Everything is important with the identity. Whether you're going forth two by two or whether you're going forth as a church to do the work of God, to take over your area. It all works through that submission. That one, because looking up, there's only one. There's look, only one when we look up. One is your master, which is Christ. Maybe many servants, but only one master. And it's important to understand that. So that and of course, in our organization, that's whoever happened to be elected because they, he represents the constituents together, and they together are the authority. And so we honor that, and that legitimate uh, structure serves us so well 
relative to our ability to get along and to work together. We need to. We need one another desperately in this day that we're living in now because uh, I, I won't get into too much right now, but at another time, perhaps, uh, let me talk to you about, uh, just, for just, just let me touch on this, that the ministry needs the ministry desperately. We need peer approval. We need peer validation. It, it's, it's the will of God, and I understand uh, the need uh, is greater now than ever before because of the isolation inclination that we have relative to COVID and everything that's going on rel relative to accusations of leadership and so on. Let me tell you this about uh, the, what's going on in the world right now. Satan is desperate to prevent what these found when they went two by two and came back saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name because that name is not only attached to the head, it's attached to the body. It's not only attached to the leader, it's attached to the follower. They're both Christ together expressing his power in Godhead. And they come back saying, Lord, the devils are subject to us through thy name. You know why? Because when the white, we talk about oneness, we are talking about two. They too shall be one. It's established in the very beginning. It goes all the way back to the very Godhead. It goes back to the fact that God delegates everything that he does. It seems almost it, he delegates it to another in submission to him that work is done through the delegate. He even spoke in creation and said, let the earth bring forth. He delegated responsibility for the earth bringing forth in that time period. And he said to Adam about a world that he had made and looked at and said, everything's very good. He said, you take dominion over this. You're going to be in charge of this. You can't fight this principle. It's God's principle. It's all the way down through history. God wants to do amazing things, but he's going to do it through the unity of the yoke. And there has to be a leader ox and a following ox to get this job done. But if we'll say we're going to work together and it really doesn't matter who's in charge, as long as somebody's appointed to do the job, we're going to work on this committee, we're going to work on this t uh, task team, we're going to get this job done. Something amazing is going to happen for the kingdom of God. We're going to come back one day to the, to, the, to the gathering of the convention or the conference or the convocation. We're going to say the devils are subject to us through this principle that when we're submitted the power of rebellion is broken. It's the only power he's got. The power of accusation is brought to nothing. It's the only power he's got. Because we love one another. And that's why I feel like in this area right now that there's a thundering sound of people moving toward the kingdom of God. Irrevocably, they are coming. They're hungry. They need God. And they need to find that person of Jesus Christ that is relative to subordination and authority. And they're on their way now. And Satan can't stop it because there's oneness here in this room. And he believes in one God and trembles. They too shall be one. Christ and his bride the leader and the follower, they too shall be one. And there's oneness here. And Satan was not able to withstand it with disciples that didn't even have the Holy Ghost yet. And he's sure not going to be able to, to withstand it when, when, when you've got something in you that's greater than he that is in the world and we unite together and say, it doesn't matter who is in charge as long as we get the job done. Yeah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wonderful. That manifestation of God in the earth today. Would you just give the Lord a little praise, redeem the time while I wet my throat here? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This thing is so powerful, you know, it can actually be that God can say, my delegate, when he comes, as soon as he arrives, has all my authority and all my identity by way of the spirit of submission that he will have. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And my government's going to be on the shoulders of this infant. And you call this infant mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of his kingdom, of his government, there's not going to be any end. And he's going to establish it. 
And I'm looking at the people that he's going to establish it through who are, in fact, the expression of him in the earth today. And so that's why we don't have to have wisdom. We don't have to have knowledge. What we do have to have, however, is the move of God's spirit that we subject ourselves to. Wasn't it wonderful what we were experiencing here in the, this service at this worship and so on? All of us subject to one another by way of submission to that that was being generated by all of us together, that move of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Let's experience that again one more time. I just, I love what I feel in this room. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Nowhere, I don't think anywhere, there is more of, of the evidence of this delegated authority evident in the earth than in that ability that we have that separates us uniquely from animals. When God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and out of man came words, God's own invisible character, the audible. And he made man the image of God. And no one's ever seen God because God cannot be seen. He fills the universe. How could you see him without definition of where he is not to give him proportion? He fills the universe. We say, of course, he does because he's a spirit, but look carefully in the Bible and you'll see that spirit refers to utterance. You can substitute the word utterance just about every place where you find the word spirit. The words I speak, said Jesus, they are spirit and they are life. And so when you receive the Spirit of God and He starts giving utterance, well, there's an amazing power there about subordination that you submit to the Spirit of God and you yield your body to Him. And God begins to speak to men through men. And... We don't know what happens when we speak in tongues, but I'll guarantee you things are happening way beyond the room that we're in when we begin to speak that language. In fact, this unique ability and power that God gave to mankind that man spurned the reality of the ownership of God of and said, I'm going to own my own words to articulate my own wisdom about what's good and evil I'll guide my way. I'll be master of my fate and captain of my soul. Words. Have we ever seen such an abundance of words? It was a, maybe about five years ago I did some research and found over a million books were being written every year. I don't know how many podcasts are being made. But it seems like words are being poured out of the dragon's mouth like a flood to swallow up the significance of the shepherd's voice. But it's going to boomerang. It's going gonna, it's gonna to undo everything that he's, up, he's, he's wanting to do because what it's doing, it's making people jaded with the sound of the world and human wisdom. It's turning people into sheep, and that's going to serve the shepherd and bishop of souls. People are getting ready for the voice of the shepherd to be spoken. And believe me, when it happens, you're not ready for what God's going to be doing. You better get ready for leadership because God's getting ready to bring in people by the millions. It's going to come. They're going to come into the church. It's going to be phenomenal because people are hungry to hear something more than the senseless jargon that's being poured out through the media. You experience it. You must, you, I know you have to feel like I am. I can't stand the voice anymore of the world. There's something about it that just is so clangy, just so, so shallow, so meaningless. Go ahead, keep talking. They're about to hear a clear sound. And while they don't have any distinction in your voice, what's coming is going to be a trumpet, a clarion trumpet call, and it's going to have the authority, and they're going to be astonished at your doctrine. 
because you're going to be speaking as one that has authority. And not like all the experts who by their wisdom know not God. Hallelujah. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. This is an amazing thing going on in this room right now. Somebody lift your voice. Somebody lift your voice. He, he is here. He is here in this room right now. He said, I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. He has a name called the Word. And within that Word, there's a character of the lion and the lamb, the yes and in the amen, the authority and the submission to the authority, the death and the resurrection. It's all here in this room right now, and it's all in that voice that's being spoken. Too bad with 600 million people talking in tongues that there's not better understanding of exactly who is expressing himself. Didn't know him then. Didn't understand him then. They don't understand him now. And because they didn't understand him, they quenched that voice. Still today, I doubt that there's a full recognition among most who speak in tongues. I don't sense that here, but I have sensed it in my own life at times when I, the Spirit of God would move on me, and of course your mind is bypassed when he's speaking, and all kinds of things start coming to mind, and it's so easy to just turn away from Jesus to the things that don't satisfy but if you linger in prayer, you begin to see things you never saw before. You begin to feel things you've never felt before. And things begin to change as the master potter begins to rearrange priorities. Beautiful things happen. So, I think it's important that the Apostle Paul told Timothy, take heed to yourself in this last day especially, that directive rings so valid and valuable. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Because each one of you, after we get past the common understanding, the common viewpoint, the common salvation of repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin that applies to every single individual. And that command that is in the beginning, that is new all the time as the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, that we love one another, that we care for one another, that it matters, that your success is contingent uh, uh, on, really, the whole because the salvation is in the body. We want everybody to be saved. We want to rejoice in everybody's victory because winners win. And if you jump on it and you say, I'm part of the team, he's, I'm part of the team he's on, and if he's having victory, I'm having victory, and winners win, then surely you're going to be edified and strengthened by that good report. The bones are going to be made fat. You're going to have better confidence like the fans who jump up and down, come home rejoicing and celebrating even though they weren't on the field because whoever it was they were cheering for did win. Like companies in an area where the sports team, the major sport team is, is successful and wins a, a tournament or whatever, those companies do better. They tell me Buffalo does much better when the, when the, bill, the Bills uh, were winning uh, almost all the way. Again and again. 
But they still, the, the, the fact that they had what looked like a winning team had an effect, they tell me, on business. Business did better. And the reason is because when we get a hold of a, a victory report, and instead of being jealous about our brother's success, we, we, get, we get enthused about it. We say, that's my success too. And if he can do it, I can do it. And if God's with him, God's with me. And we're all part of the same church. There's something powerful that happens. Don't you want your brother's success? I want it. I want to see it. I get thrilled when I come to a place like this and see a magnificent building and, and what our brother's been able to do here in this area. I get excited about it. I was motivated while I was sitting there looking at, at everything so finely appointed. I think, ah, when I get back home, we're going to be doing some things a little different when I get back home. Motivated and inspired by your brother's success. Let's be jealous, not of one another. Let's be jealous for one another. Let's, let's say we're going we're gonna to be side by side. We're in an army together. We're comrades in battle together. And we're fighting a war together. And, and if a comrade over there takes out the enemy in a, in a single shot, we're not going to be jealous of that and say, well, why did he have that? We're going to say, yeah, we're getting the job done. We're going to, we're going to go forward together. <laughs> Hallelujah. Take heed. Boy, these meetings are so important. I'm so glad I've, I'm allowed to be here tonight in this meeting. These are, these are important meetings. We need to provoke one another, inspire one another. And we can do it because this is the local level has already been mentioned here. We, we, got, we, we know what's going on in this area. And I'm glad for all the great conferences and I'm glad for all the speakers that travel all over the United States. But there's just something about hearing somebody whose voice is, be, is ringing forth in the battlefield where you're at. There's something good about that. I think it's something positive and wonderful. So, more meetings. God help us to have more meetings, even if we have to call them ourselves. Hey, brother, what are you doing today? I could use a cup of coffee. Hey, what would you think about swapping pulpits and uh, not worrying about? There's just different ways we can connect with one another. I think it's a wonderful thing. God bless you men. I feel the greatness of this district, and I'm thankful that I've been allowed to be a part of this. If I was the devil, I'd sure be trying to beat this thing. I'd sure be worried about what's going on here. In fact, if I was him, what I would do is try to get some kind of offense going in the church. If I was him, I, I'd try to get somebody mad at somebody so that I, I'd have some wherewithal to accuse. I mean, about all he's got is accusation, and he doesn't even have that unless we articulate it. He's got to have a mouth, too. He's got to have a delegate, too. So he does his best to accuse, and, uh, and, and there, there should never be any tension between the pulpit and the pew. The responsibility of the preacher, of course, you know this already, is to reprove and to rebuke, as well as to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine, and and I know I I know, I, I have to, I'm going to this is, confession is good for the soul. And I'm going to confess to you right now that. I don't know how many times I've sat there angry at the preacher. Who does he think he is? That's so good. I mean, that had served me so well because as I do that and I begin to, it begins to sort of break down. I start realizing how there's something in me that's being addressed here and I'm upset about it, but it causes me then, it provokes me to love. I better not go there. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I, I realize now why, why Jesus comes as a rock of offense. Because we, we all got this little thing with Godhood going on. I do at least. I should say most of us do, including me. I said you're gods. That's what God said. But you shall die as men. 
God knows that in the day you eat of it, you're going to be as gods. That, that, that need to be in control, that need to produce righteousness and so on, is sometimes offended or insulted by the fact that only God can be our righteousness, that he alone is our salvation, that we can't save ourselves. And I get upset about that sometime until I finally start thinking about it. And usually it doesn't take very long. I've learned how to go from reaction to recovery almost instantly. I say, thank you, God, for the word that addresses my problem and turns me back where I need to be because this whole thing's about constant course correction. I don't remember who it was. I, somebody wrote about how a, a, how a missile works, that the missile is almost always off course, but it gets the feedback from uh, the radar, whatever it is that it uses to lock onto the target, and it, and, and it adjusts, constantly adjusting, constantly repenting, <laughs> constantly course correcting till it hits the target. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to keep on course correcting. We're just going to keep on responding to the preaching and say, and we're going to keep on coming down to the altar. I don't know how many times I've been down to that altar. I don't know how many tears I've cried since I got the Holy Ghost. But that course correction is keeping me on the straight and narrow all the way to the target. I believe we're going to be there. And I thank God for the opportunity to get rid of now what the rapture will not get rid of. It's the blood that makes us right. It's not the rapture. The rapture just seals what we are. What we need is say, God, search me every time I come to the house of the Lord. Let that preacher preach right down where I live and help me to get straightened out so that I don't miss it. I don't want to make a mistake. I want to ask myself over and over, is what I am right now going to be okay in heaven? Of course, I also asked you, ask, what's it like to be on the receiving end of my ministry? Please don't answer that tonight. I don't know that I can handle that, but I'll tell you what. We need course correction continually, <laughs> preachers included. Maybe sometime, maybe even a little more from time to time. And, uh, and I, I need it. I, I need the Lord to help me. I've been asking myself, am I what God will populate heaven with? What's it like to be on the receiving end of my leadership? What's it like to have me for a pastor? What's it like to have me for a husband? What's it like to have me for a worker? What's it like to have me for a boss? Don't you want to be right with God? Just, Lord, just wash me. Make me right. Because the rapture is not going to take care of what the blood failed to do. Satan knows that. He wants to get us caught up with offense because nobody's going to be taking offense to heaven. And so Jesus offers a remedy. He said, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted to them. Whoever sins you retain, they're retained. I used to wonder about that. Now I don't anymore. I feel like I understand what that says. That people are going to offend us because we're all different and people get caught up in their perspectives and they confuse their identity with their views. And so, there'll be offenses will come. Jesus said that was going to be that way, but that's a wonderful opportunity for us to exercise ourselves in godliness. To follow peace with all men and follow after those things which make for peace. I want to go after the things that make for peace. And so I tried to get a handle on this, and I began to realize there's a whole lot of offenses that have happened in my life that I've never really taken care of yet. The debt still stands. They still did it. I have to do something about that because I want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus because that's the only thing that avails and there's no way I can have selective newness. Like I'm new, but what they did to me years ago still stands that somehow what they did is an old, there's an old man back there hurt and damaged by that. I'll tell you, it's a wonderful thing when you let go of the past and you say, uh, no, no, uh, uh, somebody's going to have to take care of this debt and it's going to be me. I'm going to write this off. Father, 
Lay not this sin to their charge. Father, forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. I don't want this on the record. And I trust in the day, my brother, when I cross that place, that divide, if the Lord allows me to stand before him. And he said, where are your offenses? Who has done you wrong? I hope I can say, no one has, Lord. No one has ever done me wrong. How can I go to heaven with somebody having done me wrong? Who am I going to tell it to? Who am I going to get together and complain about it with? No, I don't want any offenses in my life. And the only way I, and Jesus has given us the ability to do this. If you remit it, it's remitted to them. And if you retain it, it's retained. I don't want to retain one offense. I want, to, I want it to be clean. I want to say, God, nobody's ever offended me. I'll tell you what, I've been practicing this. And I want to tell you from experience, it works. If you'll go on an offense hunt and you'll dig up anything that anybody's ever done to you and you'll say, God, I'm going to be done with this. Because when you're not done with it, you drag it everywhere you go. It's with you at your time. You bring it to the church. You, you take it with you everywhere you go. But when you let go of it, you're finally done with them. <laughs> unity. I'm talking about unity. And the enemy's desire to divide us with these kinds of things. Because if you got an offense against one, well, it's going to color the way you pick up your children and what you say to them. And it's going to have an effect on the way you testify. It's going to, everywhere it's going to be there. But when you say, no, it's all gone now. Same one that gave me freely, you've received, freely give. The one that breathed on me and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, and then said, whoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them. That same one, that same power, frees me from the past. And we desperately need to be done with the past. We need to be living in the glorious right now that God's created. The enemy wants to drag us into the past, and I don't want to go there. Brother, how many of you don't want your past to count? If our past is not going to count, how in the world can somebody else's past count? It cannot. We must not allow it to be so. And so the rapture is about to happen here. The church is about to rise with unprecedented power. And people that are pure are going to see all things as pure. I don't see anything wrong. Do you really? All things are what? Pure. And to the pure, all things are pure, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. What we need first is to reconcile ourselves to all of life, and then be reconciled one to the other, and we'll be reconciled to God who controls it all, out of whom it all comes. Let's stand together and give God praise one more time. Yeah. I want if somebody just say, Lord, I'm lifting my hands to you to let everything that's ever happened to me fall off of me. I want all the past to just go away. Anything anybody's ever done, I'm letting go of it right now. I just want it all to be gone. I want to see everything is pure. I want to love with a love that believes all things. And let's pray one more time, church. Let's pray for God to baptize us. With the kind of love expression that comes out of the Holy Ghost that caused an early church to say nothing they had was their own. The release of ownership is going to bring us into unity, unprecedented unity that will cause unprecedented power because the devils believe in one God and they tremble and oneness scares them to death. And that's what Jesus prayed for. As thou art in me and I in thee that they may be one in us, oneness, no division, no judgment, no greater and lesser, just one. Let's praise God one more time while Brother Hanson comes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Longest prayer Jesus ever prayed was in the book of John for unity. He said, we're going to get this unit thing 
this unity thing covered. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of hearing an orchestra before they play. The violin, the cello, it sounds like chaos. But something happens. Someone comes to a podium, bangs a little stick, and everybody is at attention, waiting for it to move. Folks, we are at that point where God's bringing all the orchestra together to play the most beautiful sound that has ever been heard. In a world divided, we need a united church, folks. Because if we are united, there's strength. How many believe there's strength in unity? There's strength in unity. There's power in unity. There's power in unity. Unity glorifies God. I want to be united. Amen. I want to be united. Amen. And we are united tonight. We are the church. We have been commissioned by God to go forth. As he prayed that prayer, I want you to pray that prayer with me tonight. God, I truly want to be oneness more than just a doctrine. I want to go beyond that tonight. See, because I can tell you tonight when we are united, hell is definitely a fearful when we're united. Amen. My son, which is my co-pastor, asked me, he said, Dad, he said, have, have you ever had anybody try to offend you? I said, oh, they've tried. They've not been able to accomplish it, but they tried. Come on, folks. How many tonight, somebody has tried to offend you, and you said, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to let that happen. No, 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 I'm going to be at peace with you. Because we have a job to do. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're not, we're not preaching ourselves. We're preaching His kingdom, which is about to come. We're preaching His kingdom, which is about to come. Amen. So I want that. I want you to take just a few moments, if you will, in your personal life, your family, your church, your community, and start saying, God, I'm going to start looking for ways to unite. I'm going to look for ways to unite. See, there, there's more things that we agree upon than we disagree on. How many agrees we're going to get hungry again? How many agrees that it's nice when the restaurant stays a little longer open and you can get a milkshake? See, there's a lot more we agree upon than we disagree upon. Amen. And the enemy knows that tonight. So why don't we just take what we agree and what we disagree with? Let's pray about it. Let's ask God to show us why we disagree. And I think we'll find in just a little bit, amen. Because I will tell you, if you start, there are, there are unity killers, but you can, you can kill the killers. Things that are trying to kill your unity, you, you can kill them. Faith will kill. Come on, how many believe faith will do it? The Holy Spirit will definitely do it. I said the blood will definitely do it. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. I, 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 I can tell you, I have relatives. I had two of my uncles, one from Rochester, New York. He died in Citrus Springs, 103 years old. My uncle Ralph, that was Uncle Johnny. Uncle Ralph lived to about almost 104 in Derby, New York. And I asked him one time, I said, what's, what's your secret? And my uncle said, well, I'll tell you what, get over on that 10 speed and we'll go for a little while. And he's 90 at the time. And I'm thinking, I can't keep up with you. And I was only in my 30s. I, I said, I just, I can't keep up with you. But both of them not only were active, but they both had a good sense of humor. The devil hates it when you have a good sense of humor. The devil says something, and I just go, ha, 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 that can't be so. The Word of God says. Well, we're not going to do it that way because God wants us to do it this way. And we're under, under His authority. 
Praise God. How many are under his authority tonight? Do you know who the, the captain of your salvation is? Do you know who the Lord of glory is? Do you know who is coming back for you? Do you know whose blood was shed for you? It wasn't Paul. It was, come on, it wasn't Apollos. It was his blood that was shed for me. Amen, amen, amen. And I will just say this. Last night I was teaching and I said, you know, one of the hardest verses in the entire Bible I said, it's not the one that says, weep with those that weep. I said, your worst enemy's mother dies and you send flowers. But you let your brother get a new Cadillac. Well, you know, he's not really living for God. How did he get that Cadillac? Hey, hey, rejoice with those that rejoice. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Woo! I don't say they're driving my Cadillac. They're driving one like I'm going to have. I work for two owners in Hartford, Connecticut. They were owners of a company. They bought Cadillac. They bought everything together. They bought Cadillacs the same day. They got a better deal by getting two at the same time. One had a brown Cadillac, one had a blue Cadillac. And I still remember going, man, one day. And the Lord says, you really want a Cadillac? I said, no, I really don't. But they just look so nice sitting together like that. The one guy, he was getting on to us about us parking our vehicles. So you got to be careful. Hartford, you could get something stalled. You need to lock your doors every time. Poor Don, his blue Cadillac, he parked it in Hartford and didn't lock the doors. That was one of the owners of the company. And he said, there goes a Cadillac driving away. It looks just like my Cadillac. <laughs> Aren't you glad you have a God that's protecting your Cadillac? That's taking care of everything. He gave it to you. He's going to take care of it. I wonder tonight, if you'd like to be united, would you come tonight? I know there are some people that have some needs tonight, but Lord, I want you to come tonight. Let's pray for a spirit of unity to take over in our lives because we need one another, especially in this day and this hour. If there's ever been a time we need to connect, it's now. Amen. If there's ever been a time, it's, this is not just another meeting, folks. This is a time for us to connect with one another. And when you come, I don't think anybody be offended. Just lay your hand over on somebody's shoulder right now. Would you do that? And just pray, God, help us to be united. Help us to be, Lord God, conquerors together. Lord God, because if we do this together, God, we'll not only see a revival in New England, we'll see a revival, Lord God, maybe that comes out of New England, but it's going to reach around the world because there's something about a spirit of unity that just is contagious. It just, it gets on one and it gets on another, it gets on another, it gets on another. In a world divided, let's stand together. Because we're stronger together. We have more power together. Ha. We can do things together. Together we can send missionaries. Together we can, we can start new works. Together we can strengthen the works that are already in existence. Together, 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 together we can make a difference. Together, together we can make a difference. We can change the world. We can change the world because of what we have together. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God, touch my brother and bless him. Touch my sister and bless her, God. In the name of Jesus, God. Lord, we're here to, Lord, to build a spirit of togetherness, unity, God. Oh, because we are laborers together. We're in the same vineyard. And working, we're working together as unto the Lord. That one day we can stand before him and hear him say, Well done! Well done! Well done! My good and faithful servants, well done! Ha <laughs> ha! Whoa! Well done. Yeah. 
You were one. That's what I pray for. You were one in revival. You were one in purpose. You were one. You were one. <laughs> yes, God can bless unity. God can bless unity. He can bless you, sister. He can bless you, brother, tonight. He can heal your body. He can touch your mind tonight. He can provide. He can protect. Truly, he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or think. Come on, we've heard that certain sound tonight. <laughs> I talked about my two uncles, both of them, World War II, enlisted. Both of them went to Europe. And came back home and lived to over a hundred years old. I'm telling someone tonight, the enemy has threatened to kill you, but God's not done with you. But God's not done with you. But God's not done with you. There's more for you to do. You're still in your prime. You're still in your prime. God's got more for you to do. God's got more for you to do. Let's work together. Let's see revival together. Let's see churches established together. Ha <laughs> Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. This is my brother. This is my sister. We're walking together towards heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. The Holy Ghost is flowing tonight. The Holy Ghost is ministering to someone tonight. Your healing is in the house. Your deliverance is in the house. It's in God's house tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. Yes, 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 he can, yes, he will, yes, he's doing it tonight, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, you're touching my mind, you're touching my heart, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Glory. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you matched us with this hour. You matched us with this hour. You put us in the kingdom for such a time as this. We're here on purpose. And it's His purpose. Jesus. 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 
Jesus. Jesus. If you believe something's coming your way, would you raise your hand right now? If you believe a revival's coming your way, if you believe a healing's coming your way, if you believe deliverance is coming your way, if you believe that job is coming your way, if you can see that unsaved loved one coming down the aisle and saying, I want to be baptized, how many can see that tonight? How many can see that tonight? That's what's coming our way. That's what we're going to expect. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yeah, ba 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 Let's continue to worship him. Let's believe him in Jesus' name.